we're going to talk about what and Adam Hall, the chocking frames, which are not actually chocking frames, and the power crank grillage. So, Leaden Hall itself is it's a new 35-story structure. It's highlighted in red there. Google hasn't quite caught up with us yet, so it's still a hole in the ground. And it's right next to the, um, the listed Leaden Hall market near Liverpool Street. And you can see a lot of the other kind of more famous skyscrapers in the area there. Um, the principal contractor on the site is Multiplex. Um, we're going to be talking about the cranes. So the cranes were supplied by Multiplex plant and equipment with Select's input. The plan and works designer for the structure and the, who provided the concept design was RBG and construct it was our client who were doing the fabrication and the installation and we carried out the temporary works design. So quite a, an interesting contractual layout. It's quite a long system, but there was quite a lot of collaborative working between ourselves, construct it, project team, to kind of get this over the line, make sure it was all coordinated well. So that is the structure when it is going to be completed. It's getting a lot taller now, so it's getting a lot closer to that. So our design works um, essentially were the, the chocking frames and the internal climbing system, um, which uh, brought the cranes, there were two internal climbing cranes from basement level all the way up to the top of the cores. We also carried out the works on the TC2 grillage, which is slightly lower down, which James is going to touch on later in the presentation. Tacron 1 grillage, which was right at the top of the structure. And we've just finished working on the, the Derrick Crane grillage to do the dismantling when the project gets to that stage. And we've also done various other temporary works designs, not crane related on the project. So just for those that are maybe less aware of what a chocking frame is, this is more of a traditional chocking frame. So these are constructed when cranes run through structures and when there is a requirement for horizontal restraint, either to limit the sway and deflection of the crane or to limit the, the moment in the actual mass to allow it to be built taller. They operate in a very similar way to a traditional crane tie external to a structure but they obviously tie into either floor plates, steel beams, or kind of straight back to the core. So we were actually designing internal climbers and we refer to chocking frames because the two sections of the internal climber are essentially a chocking frame. They are tying the crane into the structure. So how this works was the cranes at Ladenhall started down at basement level on their own anchors. There were freestanding cranes and the jump form rig for the core was constructed around these cranes and started to build the core. After that jump form rig had reached uh, a certain height so that we could get in underneath it, we could start our construction of the chocking frames. These are built at two levels, as you can see there, and they provide horizontal restraint to the crane um, at these two levels. Once the jump form rig had got to a certain height and was getting close to clashing with the actual uh, the ballast on the crane, that was when we started to need to climb these cranes. So that's when we release the crane from the anchors and transfer the load up to just below the jump form rig using um, some ladders and these big kind of white feet, which transfer the load into the core walls. The load transferred there, the chocking frames are released slightly, so they are tight to the core, but not um, preloaded against the core walls and the crane is pulled up into its first jump position and the vertical load is then transferred back to the base of the crane to another set of feet that sit on the core walls. And that is the basic process of an internal climbing crane. This was repeated as the structure got taller and taller. I can't remember how many climbs, I think it was about 10 climbs for TC1 in the end. So this process was repeated every few weeks as the jump form rig moved up and started to get close to the top of the crane, you'd then climb the crane up and it allowed a, a kind of a progressive construction of the building. So what were the project constraints for this? So there were quite a few. So we had to construct the frames in the lift core 
itself underneath the jump form rig, which is quite a noisy, wet place when they're cracking all the shutters. We had a lot of kind of time constraints on the construction, so we had to get in after the jump form rig had moved off, get all of this constructed, get it engaged and ready to go before the jump form rig reached the, the ballast of the crane and would have clashed if it climbed any higher. One of the ones that made this quite unique is the core dimensions did not match the um, the core dimensions that these cranes were designed for. So they have proprietary feet that would normally sit on the core walls. Neither of the cores were the correct size for these cranes. So one set of proprietary feet we managed to modify and get signed off by the crane manufacturer because it was only a slightly larger width than that it was designed for. And the other one, we had to design some proprietary beams or design our own fabricated steel beams to distribute the load to the core walls. We had a weight limit on these. So the chocking frames, the additional steel beams, all the trailing decks had a weight limit of 20 tons because that's what the jacks could lift as well as the weight of the crane itself. There are a lot of casting brackets and I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail of why that scuppered one of our concept designs. So there were casting brackets within the core that would clash with anything, any elements we cast into the core walls. We also had to manage the tolerance of the core construction, both its dimensions when we started installing it and any variation as the cranes climbed up through the building. And we needed to transfer the load into the permanent works in the way that the permanent works designer had allowed for in their design. So we were kind of, fairly kind of we had certain ways we had to transmit that into the corners of the core where the core is strongest and where they had um, designed their core to take the load so it was quite a complicated project to start with and this is how we kind of managed some of the the, pro the problems that came up so the initial concepts um, that were drawn up by rbg had the loads transmitted into the the corners of the core as i mentioned where it's strong this um, concept they'd sketched up was based on when the cranes were last used at 100 Bishopgate, and it was a, a fairly hefty construction. Um, I never checked the weight of it in the end, but I believe it would have been over the 20 ton allowance for the jacks on these cranes. And as you can see there, the loads we're transmitting varied between when the crane is in service. You've got horizontal loads in the region of up to 900 kilonewtons. But when climbing, the crane is in balance and the horizontal loads are a lot lower. So our initial concepts played on this and we looked at both a frame that would allow the crane to climb when the loads were a lot lower and a more uh, robust tension system at the fixed points where the crane climbed to. So this uh, design was never developed and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute, but we looked at having rollers, some very lightweight climbing frames, uh, which are shown in dark blue to transmit the loads while climbing. And then we looked at a, a system of tension bars tied into casting brackets at the levels at which the crane climbed to so we could tie the crane in, uh, preload these bars and have it quite stiff. And it was a very similar mechanism to a bike wheel where you've got compression around the core there with the, the spokes essentially to the crane, which would then hold it in position. So ultimately this concept wasn't taken forward. As we looked in more detail at the sequencing of the jumps and where these casting brackets would go, there was a number of clashes with casting brackets for the external steel work in the core, which would have resulted in more and more jumps, which was both a, a concern for the project on their program and for on the sustainability size of your casting in a lot of steel brackets into a core wall, which is only there for the temporary condition. So in the end, as nice as this design was, it was very lightweight. It wasn't the chosen solution. And what we actually came up with was a series of compression frames that climbed with the crane and were attached to it and were kind of single use. So as I mentioned before, the proprietary feet for TC2 could be modified to sit onto the core walls, and there wasn't a huge amount of work done on that vertical lot. There was no additional steel work required for that required for that load transfer. For TC1, the crane was rotated 90 degrees, so the proprietary feet stuck out lengthways, as you can see on the 
the laser there and we designed some uh, plate girders to transfer the loads out to the actual core walls which were significantly further apart um, you can see you've got the upper vertical support there for when the crane is actually climbing and then there's a lower vertical support system situated within the lower chocking frame that allowed or which resisted the vertical loads when the crane was operating these had to have um, rotating feet to allow the, the feet to be retracted and the crane to climb up and pockets were cast into the core walls to allow the these feet to come out and to be situated on the walls and transfer the loads. The actual chock and frame, so this is looking at PC1, which is the slightly larger core. Um, these are quite lightweight frames, which were consisted of panels that were then maneuvered into position, lifted up, and then fixed to the crane mast. We've also got corner skids that run up the corner walls, which transmit the loads as per the RBG concept. And then we had some uh, we had some jacking positions here that allowed for the tolerance of the core. And this transmitted all the horizontal loads that the cranes could give. So both the in-service kind of torque loads from the crane operating and then the out-of-service kind of horizontal loads from wind load on the crane which creates a moment which is then resisted by the kind of the pairs of kind of left and right forces if you can imagine that this is just a plan view of what we were looking at so the core was at kind of six and a half by 3.8 meters and this is yeah a 2.05 meter crane mass so we were considerably the crane mass was considerably smaller than the core walls for the these lift shafts TC2 was a very similar design, but the crane was twisted 90 degrees from TC1 so that the, the feet sat onto the core walls on the narrow side of the core and the, the chock and frame sat lengthways through the core because it was quite a long, narrow core. Um, the connections were all twisted. It was a unique design, but the, the principles were the same. It could transmit the loads created by the, the crane as it um, climbed through the core and when it was in operation and that was yeah similar length almost six meters but only 2.6 meters wide which made installation quite tricky to get all of these things in so with both of these systems how we constructed it was we constructed the upper chocking frame down at basement level we hoisted it up into position on the crane mast once the jump form rig had gone through fixed it to the crane mast and then from there on, we could then construct the lower frame in the basement level and fix that to the mast. And both of these frames had a trailing deck to allow access during the climbing process. And the lower frame also had to allow crane driver access at all times to get onto the crane to do their job. So the jacking arrangement, we were looking for a, a simple system here that allowed the, the jacks to be retracted to enable the crane to climb. And what we actually settled on was using hard jacks, which are kind of wedge jacks that can pr provide some preload into it, but is only kind of a single mechanical bolt. There was no hydraulics involved. So it's quite a simple, robust system um, and kind of enabled that kind of micro adjustment when they were climbing. We also had a number of shims to allow for any out tolerance of the core that could be adjusted as required. But we expected that the core tolerance, once the, the rig was in place, would remain fairly similar within the range of the hard jack. So that was our, our jacking design, and that was sat on a rocking plate that fixed to the, the frame to allow make sure the load went right into the corner. So the upper climbing legs on TC1 provided a bit of a, a challenge with construction. So with the jump form rig in place, there was no access down the lift down the lift shaft to lower these beams into position. So what we actually managed to do was coordinate with the carries who were the contract uh, the concrete contractor doing the jump form that we could borrow a trailing deck on their jump form rig to lift up these these beams, and then when, once the jump form rig got to the right level on the crane, we could then transfer the, the these beams onto the crane and keep their trailing deck just beneath these beams because there was no other way 
to easily get these beams into position. And this gave us an additional trailing deck on the, the upper climbing beams. This is an image of the construction of TC1, the lower frame. And you can see there, that's the lift shaft door down at the, the basement level. And as you can imagine, these are quite sizable bits of steel to be maneuvering in a lift shaft. There was kind of a full construction sequence done on how we would install these because it needed to go together in a certain way and come apart in a certain way. So we kind of provided that sequencing and uh, help with the construction sequence. And this was all done after the upper frame had been constructed in the same place and lifted up into position. Uh, it's one of the pictures of TC2 in place. Um, these are really hard things to take photos of, I found, and to kind of get the scale of it. But you can see there, it's a very, very cramped place to have constructed these frames to get all the skids in and, and the jacking arrangement and to fix it all to the crane. And that's just another picture of TC1 with the trailing deck in place. Now, I think this was when we were climbing. So you can see that, or when it was being installed just prior to climbing with the, the sling still on. And you can kind of see the the interaction there between the the jacks and the, and the main frame. And that's just a detail of one of the, the corner skids and the jacking arrangements that we've got there. So that I think brings us to the end of the chocking frame section. So I'm going to pass over to James now to talk a bit about TC2A. So this is once we had climbed the crane to its required height, the TC2, which is one of the chocking frames, got maneuvered onto a grillage. So I'll let James take over now. Yes, uh, I'm going to be talking about the design of the grillage, um, the access platform that enabled the installation of the grillage and the installation sequence. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on a couple of tower crane, uh, a couple of TC2A ties to the structure, which went in place after. Um, so yeah, as Dave mentioned, um, in that image there, you had the cyan colour, uh, which is TC2. Uh, we had to install this around TC2. And then we had to, uh, so the, the crane was lifted off, serviced, and then placed back onto the, the grillage in the new location, um, which is highlighted by the red. Um, do you want to go on to the next one? Yeah, there we go. Um, so in terms of location, um, this grillage went in at level 22. And you can see uh, from the screenshot of level 19 and level 22 that it's at the change in um, core layout. So we're essentially at the top of this portion of the core and we are cantilevering over the edge. And this was all going to be installed prior to the outer frame of the structure being installed. Um, <clears throat> again, um, there were quite a lot of limitations on what we could design. Um, the Burn West designers provided the initial intent, uh, which fixed the position of the crane. Uh, it fixed the positions where the support could be provided. Um, from the core to the grillage. And it obviously you've got the the permanent work structure around it, if you want to think, Dave, um, which it's all got to work around. So they've got to be able to install that after with after the grillage is in. And what we found very early on was that the deflection over the grillage was the limiting factor in our design. Um, that along with enable um, ensuring that there was access to install it. <coughs> so as I say, the deflection was what drove this design and our job was what can we do to reduce um, the overall weight, also reduce the, reduce the deflection and reduce the weight as much as we reasonably can. So we can see on the image on the bottom left is our initial concept um, or the well, the starting point, as it were, for our analysis, and um, we ran the initial numbers, found it deflected slightly too much, and our job was to reduce this deflection without adding too much weight. So the ways we looked at this, there's several ways we looked at this. So replacing the bracing members with plate, plate girders, um, making bracing members larger, increasing the size of the raking member. 
rotating main girder beams, um, optimizing angle of the raking props, which did help quite a lot, but then realized that when we'd done that, that made a clash, so we had to put it back again. Um, and we had very briefly looked at trussing the plate girders, but um, essentially that we can see the image on the left is where we started and the image on the right is where we ended up. Um, so firstly, what I want to talk about is how we analyze the structure. So as Dave mentioned, with tower crane, you have a vertical load component, a horizontal load component, and an overturning moment that you need to resist with your grillage. Um, and that over the, the horizontal force and the overturn mode can act in any direction. So given the layout of this, we looked at every five degree interval um, for this direction in terms of uh, the moment being applied. Um, and obviously we ran the first analysis and then had a look at the initial deflections and we wanted to improve upon these deflections um, by amending the design. Um, so how do we do this efficiently? Um, humans are, by our nature, not great at reviewing vast, amount of data, vast amounts of data efficiently and without error. So we used the outputs from our uh, analysis um, and we used Excel and conditional formatting so that we could paste these outputs straight into an Excel sheet and it would highlight straight away where the deflection tolerances were too high. So we can see um, the deflection criteria that we checked in this scenario was the two diagonal, um, which was A to D and B to C, and then the uh, uh, 90 degrees A to B, C to D, A to C and B to D were the six scenarios that we checked and it's highlighted in here, I think it's Y2 and Y one were uh, where the deflection in this scenario is slightly too high. Um, and it's also showing me that the angle of um, the crane mast uh, loading uh, is between 55 and about 100 degrees uh, where that additional deflection is going to occur. And there's, there's another one between about 220 and 320 degrees. Um, so using this spreadsheet um, enable us to quickly check if I move this beam 100 mil, rerun the analysis, paste the output in here, has that improved things? Um, so that was an efficient way of do it, dealing with that. Um, so this video here shows, if you could imagine the loads being applied at five degree intervals and the, 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 the boom of the crane say is spinning around um, this, Deflected shape shows an extract from our analysis where uh, that's occurring. Obviously, the deflections are emphasized, but the principle shows that the analysis is working correctly and the grillage is moving as we anticipate it. So it's quite a funky little model there. So we've got several core interfaces to um, consider. Uh, the first one is the casting anchors. So the large, uh, essentially we have massive loads coming down raking pro these raking members into the casting anchors um, in order to resist the tension forces that are um, in them and the shear forces we've used um, weld on anchors with 32 mil bars attached for the tension and shear studs for the shear. Um, now, the shear also required additional reinforcement to uh, to resist the shear, uh, which we modelled. Uh, you can see in the, in the circular views, uh, we modelled the additional bars that were required to resist that shear, uh, which are the pink bars, uh, the, uh, the pink circles. We modelled them against the existing steel uh, reinforcement that would be in the core. Uh, to ensure there'd be no clashes. Um, the other item on there that uh, is the sort of the small box sections, it, that's a detail where how we fixed to the, um, how we fixed to the 
cast on, the, the plates to the cast on anchors bolted connections. Um, this is a typical arrangement of the tie down detail. Um, so the, the tension forces were transferred to the core uh, through a yoke, which you, which, and then down into the structure uh, through macula bars to the casting bracket, uh, which detail there. Um, the horizontal forces that were uh, a result and a result of having the braking props were transferred back into the core through shear keys, which are highlighted on the, on the left. Um, where they were located, there was four in total, two on either side. So those shear keys um, were attached to the beams before the beams were installed. And at the top of the core was concrete slab with a pocket left in it so that these beams could be positioned into the uh, with the shear keys going into the pocket and then you could grout off the pocket to prevent that shear resistance or the horizontal force resistance. Um, if you want to click again just to give an idea of the loads, this is an extract of um, our design output drawing that we sent to the Pona Works engineers to say these are the loads we're applying to your core. And yeah, the, the loads are pretty massive, <sighs> not insubstantial. Um, one thing we haven't touched on is how do you install this? Um, so we designed for the to, to allow access to actually build this and do the bolts up because the whole frame weighed too much to go on in, in a one -er. Um We designed access platforms that were attached to the, the main girder beams. Um, and the so it was split up into two large beams which are on the ends. And then a H section, which is the two sort of secondary girder beams with the uh, addition of the other girders inside. So the H section um, went in after, and that had a metal decking on it um, so that access was possible as soon as you got it in. And the whole system was safe to work on before all the bolts were done up because of how it was detailed. So the, the H section sat onto the outer beams. Um, obviously on the bottom right, we've also got the low access tech. So the installation sequence um, was to in firstly install the main girder beam, uh, the two main girder beams, and the macros were done up hand tight at this stage just to um, and sure they were fixed, but not uh, grafted in just yet. Um, so after that, we added the rear bracing. And then after that, we added uh, uh, the access platform. So that was designed specifically for this and allowed access to the lower casting brackets. Um, and on that platform, we had the two raking props pre, um, they were ratchet, ratchet strapped to the bottom of the platform. So they were, they came in and they were already there. Um, following that, the next bit to be lifted on was the H-frame, um, which we just discussed. And then after that, the raking props were installed and everything was, uh, all the MacLoys were then preloaded and the shear keys were grouted. And after a period of time, the crane was moved onto it. And so here we can see some images of the installation. So on the left hand side, we've got the first main girder beam going on with the uh, access platform on the side. You can see the shear keys on it. Uh, on the top, you can see uh, there's two of them in from street level looking up. You can see the two main beams sticking out over the structure. Then you can see the access flame going on uh, and I've highlighted where the raking props are. Do you want to click again, Dave? So you can see the access platform going on on the image on the left. This just gives you an idea of such a high profile area where this is being installed as well. You can see the gherkin and the cheese grater behind the structure. And then the image in, in the middle shows the, uh, the raking props that all went on okay. The crane's not been moved over at this time, though, at this point. 
um and then here we go um the system is in is now in use um and the image on the left shows uh just after the crane was moved across and as cool as this looked it was only probably there for a couple of months um or visible for a couple of months because the structure caught it up and so it's, it is still there but it's hidden now um it's hidden behind the structure um the last thing i wanted to touch on was tower crane ties so following the installation uh, of the grillage the as the core climbed further up and the crane climbed further up um additional ties were required to restrain the mast um these were detailed with casting so we we had to design the cast casting brackets for these um which are detailed here and you can see the one on the right hand side or the on the edge of the core required some additional rebar some u bars to prevent local breakout at the edge of the slab and the other one um, was a bit more complicated because you had the interface with the the perpendicular wall behind this behind where we were applying the load and to get over that we detailed a couple of brackets so there were two components that were cast in and they kind of fitted into one of another they were sleeved so the bolts uh the, if you look at the bottom left plan the two upper bolted connections that go through um there was a small chs section that slotted through the plate of the pink uh, component two and then they were cast in and when uh, when they came to install the crane tie there was the bracket that had to go in on the rear the bracket on the front um, to make it work but yeah certainly very interesting design and the whole of the whole of the grillage and the tc2 T, or tc2's full journey climbing up the crane um, being positioned on the cantilever and grillage very interesting and non-standard sort of design and i think that is that says dave yeah so yeah i think in summary it's been quite a, a successful project for everyone involved I, I won't deny it was definitely stressful at the start but we um we got through it and yeah the cranes have moved up safely which is the most important thing and yeah they're now both positioned on the grillages we've, we've carried out further grillage design for tc1 after that's moved off the chocking frame and we just finished looking at the Derek crane which is the final element to allow the dismantling of these cranes and the it might be later this year it actually goes in so yeah um here's some further kind of uh items of interest if you're well or wanting to learn more about temporary works and i think that brings us on to any questions 